coming here tonight to experience a uh, lecture strictly on surveying. You will be sorely disappointed. Uh, mostly do military engineering from the time period. Now, uh, surveying, of course, was a huge part of that. All right, because before you can build a fort, you got to survey the, the area that you're going to build a fort on. Before you're going to knock down somebody else's fort, you need to survey the area, right? The British Corps of Engineers at that time would be responsible for making very detailed maps uh, of anything that was under the possession of England, so that pretty much means the 13 colonies and the area to be expanded to the west. Uh, they would be in charge of building military roads, bridges, um, as we said, maps, government storehouses, things that seem rather mundane. Uh, they, they were in charge of the, I guess it's not as exciting to build a storehouse as it is to build a fort, but they, they had to do that. So, <clears throat> Normally, when I give a uh, talk or lecture, we're at someplace like Fort 96 or something like that, where we have uh, an audience, a family, uh, little kids who are just going to be squirming after 20 minutes, and I have to rattle through my lecture uh, like an auctioneer. But you guys specifically came out for this tonight, so I figure I got you for at least two or three hours. Uh, I can talk nice and slow now. Don't mind my accent. If you don't understand what I'm saying, just let me know. So, we're going to discuss really two parts today of, of military engineering. The first part is going to be the hows and the whys, a little bit of the idea of the construction. This, this is truly a, a basic primer, to use an 18th century term. And uh, we can go into more details and everything depending on how bored you folks are. Uh, I've also brought some original 18th century drafting equipment, some surveying equipment uh, that I put on display in the back, and we can talk about that uh, if you'd like to as well. So without further ado, I will begin uh, in my pontification. So, see, if you, if you use old and tiny words like ye, it looks right. Can everybody see it? Is that working on? Okay. So, we'll go back to the beginning or a little bit of the beginning, really the modern military engineering as it was known in the 17th, 18th, right up to the 19th centuries. Um, in the early days when we think of forts, obviously we think of castles, right? Or, or Roman structures, you know, kind of built in circles, things of that nature. And they were great for the time period that they were originally designed and constructed, but with the advent of gunpowder, more powerful cannons, accurate cannon fire, uh, having a very tall castle, became a bit of liability because cannonballs tend to knock those down. They're an easy target. So, enter our French buddy with a very uh, pretentious name. Uh, we'll just shorten it to Vauban. He kind of built on the, some of the earlier works, uh, notably by the Italians, uh, on how to how to change the face of fortification, fortified cities, field works as they knew it, to make them more resistant to Again, uh, cannonballs, uh, heavy-duty artillery. And so he's really considered the father of modern, uh, or the 18th century, modern military engineering. And everybody went to the French School of Engineering. The French really were known for having the best engineering schools and they sent them there for four years. The British had the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich, uh, where they sent their engineers and their artillery officers. It was all based around our buddy Vauban here. So when we think about fortifications of that time period, we have to say, okay, well, how are wars fought? How are battles fought at that time period? And you folks all being astute, um, students of the 18th century, I'm sure you already know that the common formation was the line right, for the infantry. The idea being, of course, that everybody's carrying, or most people, 99.9% of people, are carrying very inaccurate smooth bore muskets. Therefore, if we all line up in a big line and we all shoot at the same time, somebody has to hit something, right? And uh, you can't really have a war if you don't hit anything. So then the other guys, they got to line up in a line and we just start blasting away at each other until finally somebody has a bayonet charge and pushes the other guys off the field. But when we think about the fortifications of those days, we have to remember the linear tactics. The guys are going to be basically in two or three lines deep, all shooting in a straight, um, straight out ahead of them. All right. Now, when uh, 
briefly touch there on some of the older fortifications in England built by the Romans in the earlier time period. What was really prominent, you see a lot of this, a lot of circles, a lot of circle fortifications. You know, a circle would be nice, makes sense. Folks have spears and arrows and things of that nature. But if we are lining up guys with the concept of everybody shooting in a straight line, well, in a circle, it's not going to work so well, right? Because if you picture a circle and guys shooting straight out, it's going to basically be like the rays of the sun. And all those shots of your, your, your muskets are going to be diffused and you can't really bring them to bear in a massed formation. But, enter the square redoubt. So if we have all our guys lined up along the walls, well, now again, we're massing our firepower out in straight lines from the walls. So, if any of you ever have to build a fortification in your backyard, stay away from the circle. Squares are better. But squares aren't perfect. What's wrong with the square? So, like we said, these guys are shooting this way. These guys are shooting this way. That's going to create, basically, a bit of a dead zone here. Right? If you can picture this here, then nobody's going to be covering that fight. So, a square is not bad. How can we improve upon this? Well, the bond starts to work it out. What if instead of just making a square, we made the uh, walls of our fortification, be it in, in the field or, or just permanent forts? Well, we start putting these 90 degree zigzag angles in here. All right? So it makes it look right, 90 degree angle here. Well, now we're starting to cover that dead zone. Because as you can see, these guys are shooting in this direction, these guys are shooting in that direction. They're covering this area here. So that dead zone suddenly gets smaller and smaller. And if we want to use a modern military term with this, uh, right here, that is what we call interlocking fields of fire. All right, so that's going to make it incredibly difficult for the enemy to assault your works. All right, so dead zone sort of, sort of covered there. Now our buddy Vabon, he's got a government job. He's got time to think about these things. He says, well, how can we work all of these angles into fortifications from a very scientific and mathematical approach? Because the 18th century was the age of enlightenment, the age of reason, right? And so he said, well, let's go back to the drawing board on this a little bit. But what we have here is the basic outline of a bond style of fort. Now, these projections coming out here, right? these are called bastions. And this is your curtain wall right here. And these little lines that you see drawn around here, these are basically the pencil sketches you make when you're coming up with how to design your bastions. Because the idea is, if you wanted to trace this out in real life, before you started, you'd make a big old circle with your uh, set of compasses. And then you'd start to divide your circle into parts. And then, as we all learned in third and fourth grade when we were playing with our protractors and our compasses, as we start to divide that part, we can start building off all these walls that will be um, complementary to each other. So the idea is, by building these bastions on the fort, you've got this wall shooting in this direction, this in this direction, that in this direction. Again, you're interlocking fields of fire. Should somebody somehow be able to breach this area and get closer to your main wall, well, then these guys on this wall here will now shoot down into them and make them very sad. So, basically, uh, he is coming up with this, this, these mathematical principles to make fortresses uh, very formidable, uh, almost impregnable. Impregnable. Yeah, I should have drunk before I came here. I didn't even say that. Impregnable. Uh, to, uh, to attack by infantry and artillery. The other thing, too, is he starts to lower the walls, lower the profile of the fort. Because, again, if you have these really all castle walls, uh, you present an amazingly easy target for heavy artillery. But once you start to make the walls closer to the ground, it's harder to hit them. <clears throat> so, keeping that design in mind, the completed fortification is this. And appropriately, we say, voila. We have your standard Vaughan style fort. Here are your four bastions. In between the bastions are your curtain walls. And what are these big old projections coming out here? Well, uh, they have many different names depending on who's writing the engineering book at the time that you're buying. 
So some people call them detached bastions, and some people call them detached rattlings. Um, we can basically call them whatever we want. But uh, it's an idea of strengthening this um, curtain wall here by putting another bastion in front. So again, we have interlocking fields of fire. We have a big old piece of masonry here that's going to you know, stop the enemy as they advance. You're giving your troops that much further out from the main part of your fort to stop the enemy. Does anybody know where this is, by the way? My wife has been count. We've been here several times. St. Augustine, that's a good, that's a good guess. They were, they were built along a lot of the same uh, style. This is actually Fort Ticonderoga. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah, that's yeah, beautiful. It? Originally designed by the French. The neat thing about French, I'll just go off here on a little tangent for a second. That'll probably happen several times tonight. The French, when they built their fortifications in North America, they figured they were in here for the long haul. Very often, their French forts, Fort Carolina, as this was called when they first built it, uh, Louisburg up in Canada, they were very often built out of stone because the French said, hey, we're going to put time and money into our forts because we're not going anywhere. That was before they lost the French Navy War. But the British, on the other hand, were thinking more in short-term uh, matters. A lot of their fortifications were actually made out of wood and timber. And we can go into some of the discussions about that a little bit later. But, so this again is your basic a long style fort. We've got a nice uh, area on the top of the hill here. All of our bastions are going to provide uh, mutual support for each other. But what happens when you don't have a uh, textbook place like this, a level off top of the hill? Well, we can still uh, apply the same concepts of bastions, but let's, let's uh, change a little bit to adapt to the land and the area you're trying to defend. So, this is Pittsburgh. Back and forth was the pits. And of course, here is the Allegheny River. And their main idea of putting this fort here was to interdict river traffic. So along the uh, highway, as you will, the highway of the time period, you have a very long curtain wall with, again, some outer works here. This is where you're going to really put the main part of your cannon to interdict shipping coming down this highway. The avenue of attack that the British would come from. Because remember, this was originally a French fort. Here's another example of, again, adapting yourself to the land. This is Fort Niagara up in New York. Again, originally built by the French. Uh, the British came to acquire it at the end of the French Indian War. But it was supposed to, again, be defending this major highway of the lakes. So where we are going to interdict our shipping, again, we have longer walls uh, where we're going to put the vast majority of our cannon. The attack is going to come from the land side, which it really did in 1759, as I recall. So that's where we're putting our detached bastion here. But we've got to work around the lay of the land of this kind of dissonance, as it were, stretching out. So uh, we've only got half bastion here. Because again, nobody's going to do any of it salt here into this marshy ground because everybody's going to get dead. So in that case, we've got to defend from this direction. So we're taking the principles of the bond laid down and we're adapting them to the topography that we have to deal with. Now, a minute ago we were talking about these projections coming off the curtain walls and they, if money was no object, and your king had all sorts of finances to uh, spend, you could build all sorts of fanciful outer works from your curtain walls. And these are various examples. This here would be considered a horn work with an attached ravelin on top of the horn work, another attached ravelin in front of it. Here's your curtain wall, the bastion would be going off here. It costs a lot of money to make, by the way. This here is called a crown work. Kind of looks like a crown, right? Can we have dental work on here or something? Um, here we have got a whole bunch of detached ravelins ahead of your bastion. And one of the things you want to consider when you're building these detached works, uh, if this is the height of my main wall, where the main fortification is, right? Well, when I build these detached bastions, we want to make them a little bit lower. Because obviously, if the enemy gets control of this outer work, you don't want it to be higher than your fort, because then he can turn around and shoot back down on you. So even if you lose one of these detached outer works, your main curtain wall can still technically shoot down into it and uh, make life very unhappy for the attackers. 
So, as in any war, uh, 200 years ago or even today, uh, the folks on the defense usually have the upper advantage. I will just make a quick discussion here about permanent fortifications versus field fortifications. But so far, everything we've looked at in examples here have been permanent. And, of course, budgetary constraints uh, hit the military back then just as they did today. So, thing to remember, permanent, big bucks. Well, we have dollar signs here. Again, the French were in for the long haul, so they'd love to build fortifications that were going to be around for 200 years. Uh, somebody should have told them they were going to lose the French and Indian War, but that would have been a bit of a spoiler. Field fortifications, again, what the British like to do, cheaper, uh, lower skilled labor making it, and hey, if you win the battle, you get to take the French permanent fortifications anyway, so why not going to throw all your money into the cheap stuff, right? Okay, so let's take this opportunity to discuss the profile of any fortification, whether it be uh, earth or stone. Again, all sorts of mathematical principles thrown in here uh, by people who are a heck of a lot smarter than me. But the idea basically, they study all these the various military schools working with the artillery. They did studies to find out, well, your average cannon that somebody's going to drag along with a field army and lay siege to you, it would be a 12-pounder, maybe an 18-pounder, nobody's going to bring a 32-pounder because they're too heavy. So let's start doing let's start doing some tests against what a 18-pound shot is going to do against an earth fortification. And based on that, they started coming up with the proportions of what your walls were going to be. Because obviously you don't want the bad guys to knock down the walls that you're using to protect your own troops. So, uh, especially World Total Military Academy of Woolwich, I've got a whole dissertation somebody wrote at the time of, you know, well, if it's a light loam, then the bullet's going to, the ball's going to go in farther. If it's a heavy loam, it's a rating. Uh, what do we have to do exactly for thickness of this wall? So eventually they came up with these basic proportions. They said, okay, we know that if we make this ditch here 10 feet deep with an 8 foot width at the bottom, once it's on top, 17 feet here, we will then be able to excavate enough dirt from this ditch to go into the main part of the wall that will resist an 18 pound cannon shot. Needless to say, it's going to be very unhappy if you're an infantryman walking up here to attack this fortification. Now you're going to fall down in the ditch. And if you should be lucky enough to scramble up in the ditch, you've got to circumvent this wall. Not good. The other thing that we have to consider is if it is a earthen fortification, the natural slope of earth is left to its own devices after rain and everything is going to be about 45 degrees on average. So if you were to build your wall closer to the ditch, well, then eventually this wall is going to probably fall down into the ditch and it's all going to fill up. So you had to have this little area here called the burr. You think it may be convenient, like say if an infantry soldier could scramble up here, now he'd have a place here on the burr to perhaps throw grenades or something in on you. But the likelihood of that, likelihood of that happening is so remote that they said it's much better in the long run to have the burr and keep the wall from falling into the ditch. Now this area here leading up to the wall that the enemy troops would have to march up, that's called the glossy. Sea. And uh, you want that to be a, a nice, gentle, sloping angle so that the closer and closer they get to you, the more you can shoot them and the more uh, Again, everything rests on being on the defense. Uh, oh, something else I should mention when we discuss this. The effective range of your typical smooth bore musket to actually fire and hit somebody at that time, they got a general idea what that is? About 75 yards. For a 75 caliber British round left, 75 yard, maybe 100, anything beyond that, and just make yourself yield by shooting at someone, which you never really did. So, basically, you've got your troops standing up here on the firing step, leaning over, firing at the enemy. <clears throat> we know that there's not going to be any cannonballs that they're more than likely going to bring with them that's going to be able to pound this into dust. So, these guys are, are fairly well. Um, protected back here. Well, field fortifications, it's not bad. And again, this is the same profile that we're going to use for a brick and masonry fortification as well. And these guys back then, like I said, they're real smart cookies. They knew 
via you know, various tests and, and years of doing this, that if this was going to be built out of brick or stone here, uh, how many of us, I mean, we've all driven past somebody who has used a retaining wall. Like, uh, you know, if they got to make a cut through a hill to get up their driveway, they build a retaining wall. Very often, what happens after a while? That retaining wall starts to fall over again. Yeah, yeah. I'd probably be guilty of that. Luckily, I don't have a steep hill I got cut through. But, so they knew <clears throat> that all this dirt would want to push against this stone retaining wall and eventually knock it down into your ditch. So these guys are real smart. They would make the retaining wall dig it deeper, like a foundation into the dirt, lower than it really needed to be, to provide more mass to counteract the force of this dirt working on it. And again, these guys went to school, obviously, for years and years to come up with all this. So there's your basic, um, again, your basic profile. And we can, uh, you know, obviously, everything's got its own special name. But again, some of it's French, some of it's more English looking. And again, it depends on whose engineering book you buy. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about examples of what we might see more on the frontier. Now, I'm sure during the colonial period, nine times out of ten, you wouldn't have a very nice manicured lawn with a flat ball of hair and a little you know, shrubbery effect. But I wanted to show you what a blockhouse is because whether you be on the frontier of upstate New York or New England or down in the south, uh, you are going to see an awful lot of blockhouses built. And I think very often when we think of movies from the old west and everything, we still see this kind of blockhouse design uh, prevailing for fortifications. You're using readily available materials, wood, uh, timber that you're felling in a lot of the virgin forests on the frontier, so they're easy to make. But a blockhouse kind of standing out by itself while uh, looking picturesque for this particular historical society is not really the most uh, effective means of defense, right? So, in reality, most of your blockhouses of that time period are going to have a wall around them. Now, when we have these types of picket fences, it's a very specific name. It's called a palisaded wall. And the idea is, again, we're using our natural uh, forests to basically uh, cut down tree trunks and sit them in the ground so that your palisaded stockade is just oh, 10 inches in diameter, whatever trees that you happen to have. So we don't have a ditch, we don't have bastards, we don't have all that fancy stuff that you would see of a standard European type army. Uh, does anybody have an idea of why a fort on the frontier very often would only need to have a palisaded wall? So, Indians also. Indians don't bring cannons. They don't stay under no, no, it's kind of a heavy thing to, to lug around in your average Indian. It's not lug again. But that's what a frontier fort is made to defend against, right? It's Indian attack. Uh, not so much a standard European army. So here you have your blockhouse and your palisade and stockade and whatever you want to call it all. A good example, a good period example of how we would work all this in is in Schenectady, which is a very interesting way to study it. <clears throat> but you have four more. I'm Are you really? We moved down from Scotia. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to talk after this. <laughs> Where were you? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bigger. <laughs> so, um, you have in Schenectady, you have four block houses acting as your bastions, uh, and then a palisaded wall around connecting those uh, bastions. And of course, here's your super highway of the day, the Mohawk River. And uh, again, it would be very well to have defend against a lightweight Indian attack unless you happen to leave this gate open, which is exactly what they did in the winter of, what was it, 1682? Something like that? Late 17th century. And there was basically a, a little war that had flared up between the colonists and the local Indian tribes. And uh, it was the middle of winter. It was very cold. The guys who were on sentry duty here decided to build snowmen in the middle of the night and then kind of go in and warm themselves and leave the door open. At that time, the Indians came through, and that was the Great Schenectady Massacre of 16 something something. I should probably know what that was. Take 1691. 1691? My ancestors were there. No kidding. Did they get drug off to Canada? Because I know a lot of them ended up as, as prisoners. I don't think so. I know one of them was Yeah. 
Wow. See, thanks for knowing that thing. I'm in remiss. Seems how I live right across the river. <clears throat> so, what else can we do to make our fortifications formidable? Right? Well, let's build some barbed wire. I don't really have barbed wire, but we do have that seat. So when we were talking about that glacius area, the glossy, that sloping area where the enemy troops are going to be potentially marching up to attack your walls, let's put some barbed wire there. We'll take smaller trees, denude them, and then sharpen the points and angle them down toward the enemy, and then make a natural support when our tree falls. And that's going to create barbed wire. Not fun to try to hack through that and move a thousand men into the attack through there. We also have this here called chevaux de frise, a fancy French word. Uh, basically, these are movable pieces of barbed wire, uh, but you've got four by four timbers, a little bit larger, basically, and you've taken sharpened poles, you're putting them through them by uh, linking them together with chains. Uh, you can't just easily push one out of the side and move 500 guys through that bridge because they're all connected, so it makes it much more difficult. Because remember, again, we're talking about linear tactics. You're not going to send a single file of guys through any breach because it's not going to do you any good to have you know, 10 guys in a row going through because their muscles can't bring any firepower to bear on the defenders. You need to move through large blocks of guys, and this will stop them. So we get away from the black and white. Here's a modern reconstruction of Shiloh the Free. So again, just gives you a little bit of an idea of what you do with the wire. The other thing you can put against sticking out from your walls are pickets, or in the French term, frais. I never took French, I don't know if you don't know this. Uh, I actually spoke there, it took five years of German, which does not do you much good in figuring engineering manuals, because nobody wanted to study what the Germans were doing. Okay? engineering term in the 18th century, all over the French. But at any rate, we use the English term in this case, pickets. So again, coming up to Glossy, you go down in the ditch, you couldn't quite scramble up the wall where the defenders are because now you've got these pointy sticks in your way. So whatever you can do to slow down the attack is what you do on these forts, right? So that basically gives you an idea of why things were constructed the way they were, what the differences were, uh, and whether we're talking permanent or field fortifications. This, of course, is an example of field fortification. Uh, and how great the mathematical principles were behind why they were constructed. So now we're going to move on to the second part, which is the siege. All right? How do we destroy all this neat stuff that we just created? probably going to be another 30 minutes. So if anybody's bored to tears, this is an excellent time to say, oh, I got a appointment for my dog's veterinarian. <laughs> now we're going to talk about siege craft. So Vaughn, being the guy who designed the fort, also knows how to knock it down. <clears throat> right? Because it was pretty well constructed in terms of those interlocking fields of fire and everything. But anything made by man can also be knocked down by man. Right? So he knew how to, to do that as well. Let's talk a little bit about that. All right. Here is our fortification outline, right? When you, remember how all these, these bastions were supporting each other, right? Well, the pointed part here of the bastion, this is called the salient angle. Every bastion has it. This bastion has it. This bastion has it. And there is going to be a dead zone where the enemies, where the defenders' fire cannot reach. And that, if you take the salient angle, so picture, picture a line bisecting the bastion and projecting out from the very tip of that bastion, that is the dead zone. So what happens is the besiegers build their own trenches, basically, to hem you in. They want to keep you inside that fort so that you can't get any food or any reinforcements or any water, depending on where the fort is, to come in. They build their own trenches. Now they take advantage of that tiny little dead zone coming off the salient angle. They start building trenches heading toward that salient angle. Now the term for this is saps. So if any of you have ever heard the term of the sappers and miners, the core of sappers and miners, those were the specialized troops who knew how to dig these trenches and uh, eventually but we'll go into that a little later. So 
what we have here, this first line that's facing the fork is called the first parallel, because it's parallel, basically, to the fork. And we're going to put some uh, heavier cannons in here, we're going to put our infantry guys, and meanwhile, at night time, these guys are digging, 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 digging. Now, there's a, a definite uh, mathematical proportion to their madness here. As you can see, when you're further away, the angles are a little bit more shallow, and the trenches are water on you. Um, is there a possibility of our own troops coming from a different part of the country to relieve the siege? All those are going through the minds of the defenders, and if they're lucky enough, they will make what's called a sally. They will uh, depart the fort and try to attack your guys digging the trenches, digging the parallels, and all that stuff. And a lot of pitched battles happen out here on the Gloss Sea as the besiegers are laying siege to the fortress. So time's going on. Everybody's looking at the watch, and they're digging a little bit deeper. They get closer, and this is the third parallel. At this point, you've moved your guns up closer. By now, you've probably dismounted most of the defending guns on the walls. Now you want to up your, bring up your bigger cannons to try to start battering holes in the wall. Because if you can knock portions of that wall down, what is it going to do? It's going to fall into the ditch, right? Once you fill up that ditch, now it's like a ready-made bridge, and your own troops can storm through the hole you made in the wall, and they'll go in the fort, and there will be much uh, carnage. <clears throat> now, what if your cannons are not big enough to knock a hole in this wall? What's your next step? Well, that's the second part of the core of sappers and miners. You've got to start basically digging mines. So from this third parallel here, you have a team of specialists digging mines underneath the glass sea, underneath the ditch. So you're going down fairly deep now. And you want to get not under the bastion, but underneath part of this curtain wall here. Dig a mine underneath it. Pack it full of gunpowder, refill the mine with enough dirt that when you set that mine off, it's going to make a big old kaboom and uh, blow a hole in the wall. Usually by that time, unless you've got a really big-headed defender, uh, the four bullets will have surrendered. Because a lot of things in the 18th century were all about honor. You know, what have you done for your king and your personal honor to defend your king's fort? Well, Jesus, we held out for 35 days. We held out through the third parallel. Then they blew a hole in our wall. There's going to be a massacre of innocent civilians. So we can surrender now. Your honor has been fulfilled. So a lot of times, sieges didn't get to that point. So let's talk a little bit more now that we know about the mechanics of why we're digging these trenches. A little bit of how do we do it. This is slide I used a little bit previously, but it illustrates the point. <clears throat> the guys who are digging those trenches are going to have ready-made tools at their disposal. Machines, okay? Machines are bundles of twigs, usually about six feet long, maybe about 10 inches to a foot in diameter, and you're just taking branches and bundling them together and kind of tying them up with vines, so it creates a compact set of bushes. You have uh, gabions, which is sort of like a wicker basket. Again, you're taking smaller or smaller branches, sticking them in the ground to create a circle, and then you interweave vines and, and green saplings in between. You make, basically are making a wicker basket out of it, right, without, without a bottom. And we'll discuss why that is a little bit later. But, you know, all the standard tools that we're all familiar with, pickaxes, shovels, spades, you need to have these things in order to dig earth. This is kind of a neat piece of equipment here. This is called a mantle. Like that one of these. If any of you guys are really good at woodwork, let me know. I would like a, a mantlet. What does a mantlet do? Well, here is your sap party. So these guys uh, work in teams of five or six. The first man is pushing this mantlet in the direction of the fort uh, into that salient angle we were discussing, into the dead zone. Now, by pushing this mantlet, it's made out of thick, heavy beams. You know, we've got some. Uh, relatively substantial wheels on it to take the weight because he knows that being in the dead zone, more than likely, uh, a cannonball is not going to hit him, right? If anything, a cannonball might come close, it'll throw off some rocks and dirt and debris. Maybe the stray musket ball might hit him. But if a cannonball physically is, if these guys are that good, it goes through and hits that tiny little target, uh, somebody wanted to say that 
prayers that day. So the lead man is pushing the man forward and straightening out very shallow uh, earth with his pickaxe. The guy behind him is making a little bit deeper. The guy behind him is making a little bit deeper until your trench is about three feet deep. Now, where do the gabions and machines come into play here? Well, you bring these wicker, well, for lack of a better term, wicker gabions, and they are going to be ready-made portions of your wall. Because we don't want the dirt to fall back down in the trench we just dug, right? So the guys behind the initial sappers, when they dig and make the trench deeper, they're throwing the dirt into the gabions. So it's acting as almost like a retaining wall. It's actually, yeah, that's exactly what's exactly, happening, a retaining wall. Uh, so you're throwing the dirt into the gabions, you're building up your own, basically your own fieldwork, right? As you're making these trenches and saps going for the enemy, for the defenders. And then you're also using your machines that you've constructed to build that wall up a little bit more and keep the trench clear as your guys advance. And then behind the sappers team, you always have an infantry, what's called a trench guard, because what's the defenders going to do? They're going to want to try to stop you from digging your trenches, so they will sally forth and attack this uh, working party. So you need to always have infantry and support them with them. And of course, these guys tend to get tired, so they will uh, swap off. You know, after uh, 20 minutes, you're the guy with the mantle, and after 20 minutes, he swaps out with the guy behind him, and it's just a constant progression. Another interesting point: uh, these folks got paid extra for this job. So very often they were volunteers from regular infantry units that were now on siege duty. And the Corps of Engineers, under the Board of Ordnance, they have their own separate budget, separate from the infantry, that they would pay these guys for this extra labor. And their jobs to be infantry, but not sappers. Um, so it was just kind of interesting, the dynamics of the budgets. So, how can we apply this to the area we live down here? 96, right? We're all familiar with the Star Fort down there in 96, for those of us who are engineering geeks are interested in. So, what do we have here? This is what's known as the Star Redoubt, 96. Of course, it's a field fortification because 96 is the frontier. Nobody's going to put any time and effort into building a masonry fortification there. It's an excellent design. Again, we've got all of our angles here providing the interlocking fields of fire. The British, uh, well, mainly the loyalists are defending. Uh, of course, Nathaniel Green comes in with his chief engineer, Polish uh, Colonel Kosciuszko, who was educated at the French um, Engineering Academy in Paris. So he was an uh, excellent engineer, training all the 18th century aspects of the fallen siege warfare. And that's exactly what we have here. The, you know, Green's force wasn't particularly large. He knew he wouldn't be able to just storm this fort. So what do we do? Kosciuszko says, well, I guess we're going to have to dig the first parallel. And now our saps are going into the uh, dead zone of our salient angles here. So everything is almost like a European siege, but in miniature. Because we've got a fairly small army being led by Green, even smaller force of Tories defending here, basically. And, uh, so as he's digging his trenches up, here is a little artillery battery, but they only had one piece of cannon, I think it was a six-pounder. Six-pounder is not going to knock over the walls of the starboard out. So they dig a little bit closer. Here's your second parallel, right? Zigzag a little bit closer. Here's your third parallel. And here's something they constructed that was kind of neat. It's called a Mahan Tower. So basically in the middle of the night, they call it up things of that nature to dig their trenches particularly quickly. So it's a very slow, laborious process. Well, what's happening during this time period? The British in uh, Charleston have got word that 96 is under siege. So they send a very large relief force in the direction of 96 to raise the siege, fight Nathaniel Green in a pitched battle on the field. And uh, Green gets word that this is about to happen. We don't have time to finish the tunnels. We don't have time to uh, pack it full of gunpowder and then repack the dirt and blow a hole in it. We need to have what they call a forlorn hope of charge, basically. So at one point, a picked group of volunteers got into the third parallel and then attempted to storm 
the defenders of the redoubt, and that uh, was not successful. <clears throat> so, should have been a red shadow rule, well, it didn't happen. You know, normally when I'm in some uh, environment like this, they have a bunch of kids, you know, because they're there with their families, so they have no idea of what the Harvard Marsh was. So you folks are supposed to laugh, you're supposed to get something out of it. He's a chortle. I want to hear a chortle. Alright. So now the siege is over. What happens? Right? Well, obviously somebody's very happy and somebody's very sad. Uh, for the defenders, if you have lost, well then the fort's going to be sacked. What was the purpose of the siege in the first place? Was it the opening campaign of a new war in Europe? Are you going to just continue on to the next fort? Are you going to hunker down, defend the fort you just took, and uh, wait for the enemy to attack or to come to peace terms? There's all sorts of things you can do. Um, but that's basically what you do. After you take the fort, you get the spoils of war. <clears throat> if there's you know, gold, silver, anything like that, you get it and you divide it up amongst the problem basically. So that is about the story of that. So here ended this portion of the lesson. Are we all right? Sometimes we shut off the lights. <laughs> yes, sir. You were talking about the uh, expense of the forts and the stone and masonry versus the wood. Mm -hmm. The French were here first, so they intended to hold it and spend more resource to hold it. Yes, sir. And then the British came and had to build something real quick. Basically, as their armies were progressing forward up the Champlain and the Hudson River, heading up through Lake George and in toward Canada, which of course would be the main bastion of the French colonial efforts in North America, they said, hey, we're going to win this war because we're the British. So all we have to do is build temporary fortifications to secure our line of communications along the Hudson River as we take out these French force, uh, forts one by one. And so uh, when either the British or the French are building fortifications, especially permanent ones, they hire an awful lot of subcontractors. It's amazing how the cycle of military budgets then and today uh, follow certain cycles. When there's a war on, there's all sorts of money to build for it. There's all sorts of money to subcontract out stonecutters and masons who can do this stuff. In between the wars, suddenly that budget goes away. And uh, that's what happened to the British. They had built this beautiful line of fortifications, Fort Edward, um, Fort Anne, all these places along the Hudson and to guard that highway during the French Indian War. Between that and the Revolution, they just fell apart. Because if you don't constantly try to repair those wooden logs, especially those palisaded walls, they're really just going to rot in the winter. And so at the beginning of the American Revolution, the British find themselves uh, manning these decrepit, falling apart earthen uh, fortifications. And uh, now they have to suddenly defend those against uh, the early encroachments of the, of the patriots. It didn't go out so, so hot initially. But suddenly there was a bunch of so there's a war on there, it's a big budget, and we've got the money to, to build this stuff. Um, interesting, another point about the engineers. At any given time during the revolution, there was never any more, it seems like, 22 royal engineers here in the entire colonies in Canada. Because the engineers were, they <clears throat> could not buy their commissions. Those of you familiar with the British military system, if you were in the infantry and you were the son of a nobleman, you want to be a lieutenant, you got 500 bucks, you're a lieutenant. Suddenly you are an infantry officer in a standard infantry regiment. The engineers, on the other hand, had to prove that they had a mathematical aptitude or an artistic aptitude to show that they could drawing before they could actually get into the Royal Military Academy of Woolwich. So there was no way for them to buy their commissions. Consequently, there was an awful lot of 20-year lieutenants in the engineers because there was no room for promotion, right? You had to wait for somebody to retire or die to get promoted. And the British just did not crank out the number of engineers that, say, the French did. And so uh, during the Revolution, there were always this great dearth of engineers. And very often, they would have to go begging to staff officers who showed some sort of an artistic aptitude or mathematical aptitude to serve as assistant engineers temporarily to help these guys uh, with their surveying, making siege, things of that nature. And uh, 
again, we could go into all sorts of stuff about surveying, which I bought here. Again, all the tools that I have on the back there. Uh, depends on how folks are what they're punishing, how much you want to discuss surveying. But of course, that's like I said, a huge, huge part of the military engineer. Yes, sir. One problem I've noticed with engineers is there's another kind of engineer they sometimes didn't have or didn't uh, consult, and that's a topographic engineer. Are you familiar with Fort Lyon in Tennessee? Yes, no, sir. Built in 1756, in the French and Indian War manned by South Carolina troops. Mm -hmm. The top bastion is on the crest of the ridge. Mm -hmm. The lower bastion is built at the bottom of the ridge in the river bottom. Now, if you have riflemen in the river bottom, they can shoot anybody in the fort except those right behind the nearest palisade. You can be protected by the upper palisade, but not from the guy at the bottom of the hill. So the purpose they built it was to keep the Cherokee on the British side and to keep the French out. Okay. But when the Cherokee started listening to the French to convince them that the English didn't have their interest at heart, the reason they didn't, they laid siege to the fort and it fell rather quickly because it was indefensible built on a hill slope. That's a good, a good topographic engineer would never have allowed that. You know, they are supposed to, I mean, the engineers in a perfect world have to know all this stuff. They're supposed to know this stuff. And there are certain things that, um, what do I want to say? Yeah, I guess a lot of times life is a series of compromises, right? And you, you say, well, where are most likely avenues of tax going to be from? Uh, just like if you're familiar with Fort Ticonderoga, the Americans, once they took the fort, in 1775, they held it, uh, but they did not fortify the mountains around it because they said, hey, you can't drag a gun up on top of Sugar Hill. Hill. You can't drag a, a gun up on top of Mount Defiance and shoot down and into Fort Ticonderoga. The British proved them wrong, right? So they did. They hacked their way up this mountain. They dragged, drug the guns up with a block and tackle. Um, so sometimes you've got to make that decision, I guess, where's my most likely attack going to come from? And what I was going to show uh, just briefly here, if we just recall back to the slide, they don't have, um, when we're used to modern maps, you see the outlines of hills, the little numbers in there telling you what the elevation of the hill is for that, you know, and then you can look at how they've written in those numbers going down the slope of the hill, and you can tell how steep it is. That hadn't come about in the 18th century. That's really more of an early, uh, mid-19th century. So they, uh, to show slope at that time period, they put in these hash marks. And if the hash marks were very long and narrow together, that meant it was a steep hill. If they were more wide apart and shorter, well, it was kind of a gradual slope of the hill. So, uh, like I say, yeah, somebody obviously dropped the ball on it. It happens. Not everybody's a good engineer. I'm not a good engineer, because I only do this on weekends. I, I play an engineer on the weekend, but that's about it. Right? Anybody else have any comments or questions? No. Yeah. Sir, we talked about not just force of how the area was sectioned off by the different instances of that area. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Who wants to get into the city and how the town was going to set? That's a good question on the part. Who makes the decision how the town is set up? I'd say the guy with the most money makes the decision how the town is going to set up. It's really hard to say. I mean, <coughs> Depends. Is the town built for agricultural purposes? Is it built because there is a major communications highway like the Hudson or the Mohawk or the Reedy River or whatever, right? I guess it all depends on how it's, how it's going to be laid out. But I think money talks back then just like it did today, right? So whoever had the most money had to say where the town was going to be and he, whether or not he got the best land. You know, you know, my, my general impression. Uh, very big on sectors. Oh, I'm sorry, you're talking about the technical details? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, well, um, yeah. Okay. We had, uh, or they had at that time, their main measuring device was the chain. And I brought chains with me here for those of you who really want to look at that stuff. And you have different lengths of chain. One chain, uh, each length of the chain is one foot. 
and there's a hundred links of chains. So that's hundred feet when you drag that chain out. That is specifically known as an engineering chain. And it's great for military engineering because it's easy to know one foot, right? Well, the civilian surveyors very often use what's called a gunter's chain. And each link in the gunter's chain is 7.92 inches. Everybody says, well, that's great. Who cares, right? Woo! That's 7.92 inches. Well, a 100-link gunter's chain is 66 feet. Who cares, right? Well, that makes a little bit more sense, though. 10 square gunter's chains is an acre. And, and a lot of times you see in old deeds, you see things uh, in terms of rods. There's 16.5 feet in a rod, so there's four rods in a 66 foot gunter's chain. It's divisible, that gunter's chain is divisible by a lot of the other common measuring devices today. Um, furlongs is a very even number of um, gunter's chains into furlongs. So when you see deeds and how are things laid out at that time period for civilian use, are going to be in gunter's chains, acres and rods, links, you know, link of chains. What is your favorite folder? Uh -oh. that you've been with? That's a good question. I never really thought about it. My favorite fort is the one where I'm not going to a little summer and sweating to death out there. I'm trying to do all that surveying stuff. Wow. Well, you got me there. Crown Point was pretty interesting. Crown Point was the largest British fortification in North America. That was a permanent fortification, brick and stone. They spent the equivalent of today's dollars, millions of dollars building it after the French and Indian War. Uh, just in case the French ever tried to encroach again on the Champlain Valley. And just as it was about to be completed, somebody was cooking one day in the barracks. And the fire, the cooking fire, got a little bit out of control and, and caught the roof on the fire of one of the barracks, which then eventually spread in the powder magazine and blew a big old hole in their beautiful multi-million dollar fortification. That was the end of Crown Point. Um, but when you're actually on site and you look at the scale of it and, and how the barracks were constructed, because a lot of this is still intact. It's just mind-boggling. You can see why it was a multi-million dollar thing. So that's kind of a neat place. Fort Ty's fun, too. What was the location of that one? The one where the Crown Point. Yeah. It's right uh, between, well, it's, it's on Champlain, at the southern tip of the Champlain. Uh, Vermont's on one side and New York's on the other. Neat, neat story behind it. Well, very sad. Story. Kind of, hey, it wasn't my tax dollar. Before my time. Anybody else? What's West Point for? Yes. Yeah. West Point was really neat because it was uh, constructed to stop the British from using the superhighway of the Hudson. Right? And it started out more along the line of the shore batteries. Remember we were talking about how we had these batteries along the shore? And that's really what it was. And uh, they built this huge chain uh, that floated, huge iron limb chain, big, big deal, that uh, was floating on. Uh, Oh, it was like little pontoons, and it blocked the Hudson. So if the British ships were going to come up the Hudson, they had to make a turn there at West Point, which was very hard to do with the sailing ship. And this chain would be stopping them. So they would have to find a way to hack through that chain. And while they're trying to hack through the chain, you've got cannons on one side of the river and the other side of the river putting crossfire on those ships. So the British were never actually able to take West Point. And the vast majority of the fortifications designed at West Point were from our buddy, our Polish patriot, Kosciuszko. He doesn't get enough credit for what he did at West Point. But he was very instrumental in making it the Gibraltar, as, if you will, of uh, that part of the country. As a matter of fact, is there going to be a talk coming up here in Kosciuszko? I think I saw it a couple of months. Somebody's going to come and talk. I might just come back for that. I, I think he's great. He was, he was a really neat guy, but I don't want to spoil all the stuff she's going to talk about. Any other questions? You can always, you know, again, if we're interested in the mechanics of surveying, you can mosey on back and we can talk about the stuff I brought. Uh, other than that, I guess here, uh, here ends uh, my laughing at you for the last hour. Thank you.